Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. George Lois rose from the streets of the Bronx to become a legendary art director on Madison Avenue. Across a six-decade career, the New York Times said, Lois put the counterculture of the 1960s and 70s into post-war advertising and created stunning covers for Esquire magazine that rebuked American racism and involvement in the Vietnam War. Here's one. Muhammad Ali, convicted of draft evasion for refusing to fight in Vietnam, depicted as the martyred St. Sebastian. And when he was hired by a struggling airline, Lois designed a commercial featuring Salvador Dali. Now tell me the truth. Don't you think a knuckleball is much harder to throw than a screwball? Oh, no, 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 Whitey. Whitey Ford and his new friend Salvador Dali always fly Braniff. They like our food, they like our style, and they like to be on time. Thanks for flying Braniff, fellas. When you got it, flaunt it. Tell him, Dali, baby. Tonight and continuing next week, a special tribute to an amiable anarchist, George Lois. Our celebration of the life of George Lois begins with a significant decision he made seven years ago. He discussed it with me in a visit to this program. George Lois recently announced he will donate his archives to City College. The Esquire covers, the inspired humorous television commercials, the print ads, all of it. The legion of commercial logos as well. CCNY truly has struck gold. The bounty includes 92 Esquire magazine covers. Before George Lois, magazine covers were prosaic. Now suddenly they were controversial, irreverent, provocative. Graydon Carter, editor of Vanity Fair, says George had a genius for compressing subversive ideas into compact graphic powder kegs. Equally surprising are George Lois's television ads. Here they are again, the Pontiac Choir Boys. Walked into my showroom, we tried very hard to agree. MTV Music. I want my MTV. Lois's print ads still sizzle as well for a lipstick, for a chess match, or inventing a mythical beast to sell imitation leather. Finally, there are the Lois logos, his creative branding of thousands of products, marketing them through stimulating visual images. All of the work now to reside at CCNY to be studied and maybe to inspire the next George Lois. Welcome, George. It is a delight to great, have you. Great being with you, Tony. Why uh, CCNY for the archives? When I was uh, 14, my public school teacher sent me to uh, the school, the high school of music and art. Right. It made my life, as far as I'm concerned. I could have gone to uh, David Clinton and become a, a thug, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but say, that's how I was saved. Uh, and high school of music and art, which was, in my mind, the greatest, high, the greatest school of learning since uh, Alexander sat at the feet of Aristotle, um, uh, was, is on the very edge of the city college uh, uh, campus. campus. Uh, and somehow I, I feel like I'm coming home, you know. But the, but the real point about the school is I really, schools all over the country were trying to get me for years and years and years. I decided it had to be New York. And when you look at all the colleges in New York, I wanted to go to the most democratic college, with a democratic body, a body of kids in, 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 the, in, right, in America. And, and I love the idea that that I'm talking to kids and I, when my work is, is being studied by kids, they, it could be studied by anybody in the city that can go there, but it can, it's studied by kids who, uh, who grew up in the streets like, uh, like you and I did. You're talking about music and art at uh, high school and, and how important it was, and you told me uh, in an earlier conversation, it was an epiphany for you there. There was, there was, there was an, things that happened that really made you who you Sure, tell, I, tell actually, you. Uh, I was ju still 14, and I was in my first year and, uh, of, of design. I mean, I drew all the time, but first year of design. And they, and they taught you, got into, they got you into design by 
how many you work on abstract things. For instance, I'd, there was a there was a class where uh, once uh, once a week uh, you you went in and you said, okay, do a design of circles, and you cut out and you made a design of circle, eighteen by twenty pages, and, and uh, we'll do a design now do, uh, do a design of triangles, right? Okay, now do a design of triangles and and, and rectangles. Now do a design, and everybody was basically uh, ripping off uh, Mondrian or or, her, or Paul Clay or mm -hmm. Kandinsky, etc. And it got to the last class of the, year of the term, and my teacher, Mr. Patterson, said, um, all right, uh, he gave, gave us a piece of 18 by 24 pay, a Strathmore page. I'm, <laughs> the what you do today is going to be half, count for half the mark for your term. Mm, now, and, and it's going to be based on just rectangles. Rectangles. Right, and everybody started cutting out rectangles, and we're doing a, you know, a Malevich, you know, with a square here and a square here, and, a, and I sat there for an hour, the paper there, and Patterson was walking around. The, he knew I was a terrific student. He said, "Time's up," and, and he taking everybody's, and he came, comes up to mine, and he's about to grab it. And I said, "Excuse me, hold it," and I wrote, I signed my name G. Lois in the corner of a perfect 18 by 24 rectangle. Just. Left it white, blank. Right. What I had taught myself to do is to, is no matter what pro the problem is in, in anything you have to design, including an abstract piece of design, right. surprise, do something unusual, do something where that knocks uh, the people's, you know, knock, knocks your, your, your down when you see what, what I see. And, and to, to me, and I, and I based everything I did in my whole life on the fact that I have to surprise, I have to shock, I have to... Well, we're going to be see seemingly outrageous. You know? Yes, and we're going to see plenty of surprise in your Esquire covers that we're going to spend uh, much of the rest of this program talking about. Uh, between 1962 and 1972, George designed the covers for Esquire magazine, which became so renowned that many of them are in the Museum of Modern Art in the permanent collection. The editor, Harold Hayes, comes to you and, or how, how does he know about you? Why does he come to you? What is he looking for? Well, uh, in 1960, the first week of 1960, I left Doyle Dane Burnback, which was, the, which was the only creative agency in the world. And I was you were a, at Do Doyle Dane, you were a, And I was a hotshot art director right, there. Art director. And unbelievably, I shocked the, the advertising and media world by leaving at the start the second creative agency in the world. And we and we were immediately successful. It was the only air agency ever created with a, with an art director name on, on the masthead. So. And he was reading about me and my once a week in the Times. There was always an, always an article uh, in the advertising column based on a campaign Something, I did. Yeah. So he was watching that while he was a co-editor with two other guys fighting for the right to be the head editor. And the day he became, they named him the editor. We're talking Esquire. Esquire. He calls me up and he says, can we have lunch? And I said, yeah. I thought he was trying to sell, uh, tell me advertising for my agency. <laughs> and we sat down and he immediately said, uh, 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 very nice to meet you all. I said, oh my God, he's a southerner. Luckily, I found out pretty, pretty quickly he was a southern liberal, mm -hmm. which to me was always an oxymoron, you know? Yes. And he said, basically said, uh, what, I wonder if you could help me figure out how to do better covers. How do you do them now? Well, you know, we're, we're, you know we are all, everybody here, the, the, the editors, the art directors, we all get together once a month and we sit down, we try to decide what story we should do a cover on. I say, yeah. And then we all come back and maybe three, four or five of us come in with an idea and we comp up a couple. I said, whoa, 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 group, grope. He said, what do you mean? I said, <laughs> I said is that the way you work with uh, James Baldwin? Is that the way you work with Kate Talese? You have to, no, of course not. I said, so, so, so what do I, I said, well, you got to go out, you got to get somebody. Obviously, you don't have everybody there now who knows how to do it. Otherwise, they'd be saying, here's a cover. So you got to go out and you got to get somebody. You know, uh, uh, he said, how can anybody do a cover if they, if they don't understand what Esquire is? I said, if you can't do a, a, an issue of Esquire where any good, great graphic designer can look at it and say, that's a cover, then you've got a lousy magazine. He said, uh, so I started to give him names of people. And he said, wait a minute, you all got to do me a favor. 
you got to do me at least, you got to do me one cover, because I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I said, okay. Well, uh, let's show the one cover sure. that you did. I mean, he, Harold Hayes says, I need help. Okay, you show me what you mean. And what, a week later? No, four days later. Four days later. Over the weekend. This cover shows up on the cover of uh, Esquire magazine three or four days before what was going to be a titanic heavyweight fight between Sonny Liston and Floyd Patterson. Tell us what and, this cover And Floyd said. was an eight-to-one favorite. Floyd was, of yeah. course. So, um, you know, I said to, I said to Harold uh, at lunch, I said, uh, tell me what's in the, in the issue. I'll do a cover for you. Uh, he said, and he starts naming them all, and he mentions barely mentions that there's going, to, there's going to be a piece in there, uh, a two-page piece about Floyd Patterson and, 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 and Liston about the fight. Uh, I immediately knew uh, what, what the cover was going to be, didn't tell him, I uh, said, I'll deliver, I'll deliver a uh, cover to you in four days on a Tuesday. Uh, run, uh, call, my, uh, call a photographer, Harold Hayes, uh, Harold Krieger. I said, get me a guy who's built like Floyd Patterson. Let's go to St. Nicholas Arena, which was still up there. Again, sure. And let's take a photograph of Floyd Patterson, supposedly, laying dead in the ring and everybody left them in an empty ring. This is, again, this is four days before this sure. fight. And I'm calling... And now Esquire is going to be on the newsstands with a cover that says, that basically is predicting the fight before, against, obviously before the... Against what every ex sports expert thinks. In fact, when, when the issue came out, there was an editor, there was a publisher's page that said, you see that cover? We have nothing to do with it. <laughs> A, a, a young afraid. designer by the name of George uh, Lois did. We didn't do. Anything. We didn't do it. In fact, I found out a, a couple of years later that that the uh, that the, the publisher and everybody there said you are not going to run that cover. We cannot take the chance. And Harold Hayes said, if you didn't run it, I'm going to quit. So his reaction was he loved it. His reaction was this is a chance to do something incredible. Uh, in fact, when, when Howell he said to me, at, when he first saw it, he said, my God, he said, I never saw a cover like this. I said, uh, right. Uh, not only that, uh, you're calling the fight, said, right, but nobody agrees with you, right. He said, you're crazy. I said, you're crazy because you're going to run it. He said, why am I going to run it? I said, because at least you got a 50-50 chance of right. <laughs> you could uh, learn the history of the 60s uh, a lot, lots of ways. One way would be just to go through the covers of Esquire magazine throughout the 60s. And this was uh, December of 1962. Let me explain it. This yeah. never ran, you understand? I did this when I read a little piece in the paper in the Times that said 100th GI killed in mm -hmm. Vietnam. And I did, and that photograph that I used, of, of a, I couldn't get that f photograph of the guy from the State Department. They went there, Gary. So what I did is I used picture of me when I was on R&R &R in Japan, because mm -hmm. I was in the Korean War. And, um, and I showed it to Harold, and I, to, I sent it to Harold Hayes, and he said, oh my God, wow, but George, there's a real problem here, because you know, the war's going to be over by then. All, there were the politicians right. saying, oh, the war will be over by Christmas, blah, 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 blah. And even though he had promised me that no, no cover I ever would do, that he would get, be killed, I kind of had to give in, you know, and for years afterward, he says, why didn't we run that cover? Because you know, mm -hmm. what happened is when uh, it, it finally, by the time we got out of, out of Korea, we had 58,000, 13 years later, 58, Vietnam, Vietnam. Vietnam uh, 58,000 sure. men got killed and millions of, of, uh, of uh, Vietnamese got killed. Talking about provocative, which is one of your middle names, and <laughs> it showed up on the covers of Esquire all the time. Uh, the editor, as I understand it, Harold, asks you for around in December, make me something Christmassy, <laughs> and uh, this is the result. That's Christmassy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, he never told me what to do, but he said, Shoot, George, I love your covers. I love everything about them. My God, you know, our circulation is going up like crazy. I mean, I mean we, we, we didn't, we, you know, we're finally in the, in the, in the black, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but can you do me one favor? Can you make the cover for Christmas Christmassy? I said, sure, you got it. 
so what I did is I uh, I took uh, by that Sonny Lester was champion of the world then. This is 19 what 63, 63. September 1963. I got I got him because I got Joe Lewis. Right. To, to, to get them for me. But in 1963, I think, my guess, uh, not a lot of folks expected to see a face like that it was coming a, down the chimney. It was, at, a, it was a time of terrible, uh, uh, you know, racial, uh, you know. Of course, uh, that's uh, my... Uh, I mean, it was, uh, everything was... And, in fact, I had my liberal friends were all saying, you know, I don't know, George, he's, uh, you know, we all care about racial justice, but everybody's going, they're going a little too far, et cetera, et cetera. So what I did is I showed the cover to Cassius right. Clay. And he looked at it and he said, oh, hey, J hey, George, that's the last black <laughs> America would want to come to see coming down that chimney. <laughs> <laughs> so he did, he got it like that. You know, he oh, understood, sure. whoa. So it shocked, it shocked. And I'm telling you, it not only did that, it... It, uh, it cost the magazine a bunch of hours. Oh, yeah, man, I think, I think 15 advertisers from the South. It was, it was still the Jim Crow South back then, you got to sure. understand that. A, a quit advertising in, in the magazine, and of course, and 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 if you, whenever I, sh I did something I thought was going, I knew it was going to be really controversial. I would say to Howell, Howell, this one's going to really be make trouble, and he would always say, "Yeah," because yeah. he understood that that kind of. Well, you bring up the point. I mean, we're talking about how much the the Sunny List and Santa Claus cover cost the magazine in advertising, and you're coming out month after month with these in-your-face things. Uh, did they work? Did they sell the magazine? Did they? Well, they went. Uh, it went from four hundred thousand to two million. They sold the magazine. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't. You got to understand, from, from beginning with the first cover, if they didn't work, uh, everybody at the magazine, all the uh, the people who sell advertising, and, all, and all, they would have been so happy. To, to get rid of me, you know, because sure, of course. because I made trouble. But the, so as as I was making trouble, I would say, yeah, because he knew that that would drive the magazine, and the circulation went up and up and up and up. Number four is an actress very popular at the time, and there she is on the cover, uh, shaving, <laughs> Verna Lisi. Verna Lisi. Uh, it, this was uh, pre Friedan, pre Abzug, pre Steinem. And there was an article on the masculinization of the American woman. And it kind of was, set, was saying, here, yeah, it's going to happen. I need women are getting strong and tough and they're not taking any more right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I had to do, I figured that would be, be an exciting cover if you, you know, if you, uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, uh, uh, I think I'll just have a woman shaving, you know. <laughs> and, and what was happening, funny, I, would, I went after every, actress in, 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 in known to mankind, and I could not get a woman to do it. I, I, a couple of months later, I, I did a cover with that involved Kim Novak, and she said to me, "You must, you, you must be, the, you must be the guy who did that cover." I said, yeah. "I said, yeah." She said, "I would have given my left arm to do to, to be in that." I said, "Honey, now you tell honey, me. I called your agent, and he told me to screw off." <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to number five. The man that America saw on television every Sunday night, and he never looked like this on television. Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan. I mean, I, he, you know, he's, he's introducing the. He had introduced uh, Elvis before, and now he's introducing the Beatles. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, on a Sunday night, I said, "My God!" I said to my wife, "I, I, I got to get it. I got to get." I call up the, uh, 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 William Paley, the head of CBS, the next morning because he was a big fan of mine, I, and I, it was my first important job working for CBS. And, uh, and he said, oh, I love your covers, George. I love everything you do, but no, you're not going to make fun of Ed Sullivan, you know? I said, oh, my God. So what I, instead, so I went and I stood on line outside of Ed Sullivan Theater. Right. And, and I, had, I, I, I had designed, when I was at CBS, I had designed the marquee. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting for him to come out along with a whole bunch of other people. And he finally comes out again. He gets to the, to the chauffeur car and I, and I show him the cover and I said, but, but I explain it. And he showed up the next morning, and he sat down. I put the wig, wig on him, and he, and he smiled like Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Back to the theme of Vietnam. Now it is 
1966, and America is beginning to realize this war isn't going away so quickly. Yeah, and it really shook up America, and it shook up everybody in the Senate, and they, they were standing up in the House of Representatives, charging, uh, you know, charging uh, you know, us being an American, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't understand how the world didn't understand, um, the American didn't understand what a terrible war that was in, that we were in, you know, a mm -hmm. bad, bad war, actually a war of genocide against the, the, the Vietnamese people, I thought. And this cover is not the same theme, but uh, so many of Lyndon, uh, 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 so many of Hubert Humphrey's uh, supporters were disappointed in his, uh, I guess, what would you say, support, his acquiescence to Johnson policies. And here you've got, uh, here you've got uh, Hubert on the cover as, as a dummy. As a dummy, as a dummy, and 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 uh, and, and 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 of course, LBJ says, uh, "You tell him, Hubert." Uh, I was in the vice president's office a year later, and he had that cover, Humphrey's office, hanging in his ante room, and I, when I went to saw him, I said, "Mr. Vice President, I, I just want to tell you before we start talking." I did that. I designed that cover. What do you mean? You did? I did. That's what, he said, he said, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and then I said, well, why is it hanging there? He said, because to remind me that, that it was right. Mm. This is, uh, what can I say? Muhammad Ali as uh, St. Sebastian. Uh, At a time, by the way, when this is 19, what, 68, and, right. and Ali is, uh, they've stripped him of his title. Uh, Waiting for the big... Supreme Court to right. decide on his, uh, his case. Uh, it, it actually, it's a cover that basically sums everything up. It's, it was a cover of, uh, uh, about the Vietnam War and about race and about religion. All in one, in, in one. You know, let, put that back up for a second, and let's just let's just point out the difference between something like this and that in an image, with virtually no script on the page. Right. Look at that, and then think of what you see on newsstands today. Every magazine cover has a celebrity. It's got forty-seven different items: how to get, how to lose weight, how to have better sex. And you look at something like that, and you say. Well, there it is. I all the magazines it. today, they, they handcuff themselves. You got to understand that a lot of my covers are cele have celebrities in them, you know. But but what I do is I iconize them or I knock them, you know. Sure. Uh, uh, but but they but the publishers and the editors all are handcuffed because they are stuck with the the flavor of the month. Uh, uh, you know they've got Tom Tom Cruise whoever it is. Uh, I mean, right. Who cares about what Tom Cruise thinks about in the in this world? You know, and then and then they slap about thirty uh, uh, blurbs on them. You know, we're all you know, figuring they'll sure. they can sell magazines because of the blurbs. I refused to have any blurbs on my uh, on my covers. And Harold understood. Harold Hayes understood why. Because I wanted to make one statement that knocked everybody on their ass. Yeah, he would yeah. say. Let's jump ahead. I, kind of summing up the, <laughs> the change in culture. This is Andy Warhol. If you can't make that out, it's Andy Warhol drowning in a... I call up Andy and tomato I, soup and, can. Andy was a big fan of everything I did. I called him up and he's at the factory. I said, Andy, I want to put you on the cover of uh, Esquire. He said, yeah, yeah. I can even say, yeah, I'm going to be on the cover of Esquire. Wait, wait a minute, George. Wait, wait, what's the idea? I said, Andy, I'm going to have you drowning in a giant can of Campbell's soup. He said, oh, I love it. And then he said, but won't you have to build a gigantic can? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take one more look uh, at the uh, the Vietnam War. This is the lieutenant who was responsible for the My Lai Massacre. Yeah. And you've got him on the cover smiling with four Vietnamese children around him. I, I, mean, always, I always told everybody who was going to... I always explained everything perfect to anybody who came. You know, I, you know, I explained it. To, and I, this was a, an excerpt... There was going to be an excerpt in a magazine by John Sack, who was a great writer, who was doing a book, a book on the confessions of Lieutenant Kelly. And I called up John Sack and I explained what I want, wanted to do. And he said, George, he'll never do it. I said, could you get him, at, could you get him to come so I can talk to him? He said, I, that I can do. Mm -hmm. But the George, I don't think he's going to do the other thing. But let me have a crack at him. Okay. So he, he brings the rusty, they call him rusty. And I, um, it's the only 
time I ever did a cover where I kind of really bull****ed it, I was sitting in the dressing room with him, and I'm talking about the fact that I was a Korean veteran, and I was in a lot of firefights, and I saw all kinds of stuff that happened, and I saw, you know, blah, 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 I saw all kinds of civilians being killed, and it's the fog of war, blah, 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 blah. And he, I saw, I, he saw I was with them. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, Rusty, I want to take a shot of you with three or four Vietnamese children. And basically, you're saying, Say I'm okay. I, yeah. I love the kids, right? All right. No, what I was doing there was I, I and then yeah, he didn't get it. And then I mean, yeah, you, and then we're shooting. Then we're shooting it. We're saying okay, okay, Rusty, good, 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 good. Terrific, terrific, Lieutenant. That's great. Now give me, now give me a eating grin. And he went. And now. That's the money shot. Exactly. Because I wanted to nail the kid. Because you know, even though know, you're, you're putting harm's way by our misleaders in the world, you don't. He and a lot of other guys in, in, in the Korean War and the, and the Vietnamese uh, were psychopaths, and were responsible exactly. for killing. He was responsible for killing 500 women and children. Yeah. Well, the editor who hired you and 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 uh, was uh, loving every cover you gave him summed it up very well saying giving george lois free reign to create esquire covers was like giving a hand grenade to an anarchist <laughs> here is the anarchist more from the mind of the amiable anarchist next week when we explore george lois's groundbreaking ad campaigns his posters his iconic logos and more be with us then.